Cancer Newsline, a podcast series from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Cancer Newsline helps you stay current with the news on cancer research, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention, providing the latest information on reducing your family's cancer risk. I'm your host, Lisa Garvin, and today we have two guests. They're both from our Department of Neuro-Oncology here at MD Anderson, Assistant Professors Dr. Evo Tremont and Karen Woodman. Welcome to you both. Thank you for coming and being with us today. Thank you for having us. And what we're going to talk about today is some sort of the neurological problems that can crop up with cancer treatment. Um, Obviously, you know, we... Some chemotherapies are still very toxic but effective, and it seems like nerves can get affected pretty regularly with certain treatments, correct, Dr. Woodman? Yes, so uh, peripheral neuropathy um, is seen about 5 to 10 percent in the general population. In our cancer population, it's, it's higher because of some of the chemotherapies that we use. So the b- three big classes of chemotherapies that can cause peripheral neuropathy include the platinum agents, so cisplatin being the major um, uh, offender, uh, the taxanes, so taxol being the first drug um, that's uh, heavily associated, um, and the vinca alkaloids, so vincristine being the main component of that. And tell me, what is neuropathy? I think a lot of people know, especially diabetics who have to deal with us on a regular basis, but what are the common symptoms of peripheral neuropathy, and what is exactly the physiological thing going on? Yes, so, um, you know, there's a wide range of symptoms, but very commonly patients might experience sensory symptoms first, and that ranges from a lack of normal sensation, what we call numbness, um, to uh, having abnormal Um, additional sensations such as tingling, pins and needles, uh, burning, um, lightning or electrical sensation. And so you have the absence of normal sensation and then additional abnormal sensations. You can have pain, what we call neuropathic pain, um, which is of, of a burning or electrical nature. And then you can have weakness, so motor weakness, because the motor nerves that go to muscles can also be affected. Have you found that there's any particular demographic that's affected more than others, or is it kind of sporadic in nature? Yes, so um, good question. You know, because um, diabetes is the most common uh, cause of peripheral neuropathy in North America, um, you know, we have a lot of diabetics who are cancer patients, and so they're already coming Uh, with one vulnerability to developing peripheral neuropathy. And then they have a neurotoxic chemotherapy, and so they tend to be affected more heavily and also more frequently than a patient without diabetes. Is this something that you warn patients when they're on particular chemotherapeutic regimens to say, hey, this is a possible side effect and you should watch for it? Yes, I'm sure that patients, you know, uh, are warned by their primary oncologist when they come to see me, um, they tend to, to be uh, either someone that has particularly um, troublesome symptoms of peripheral neuropathy that's not manageable um, by the primary oncologist, uh, or they, you know, they have um, uh, just, they've developed the peripheral neuropathy and um, they need further workup uh, to find additional causes of the neuropathy because something's a little bit atypical about their case. And Dr. Tremont, how do you work therapy for these kinds of disorders into regular cancer treatment? Is it a simultaneous thing or how do you manage this along with cancer treatment? Right. The, what happens is that the, we, we haven't found or there is no available specific treatment that will be effective. Uh, preventing or tackling the 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 uh, problem in the background. What we do have is medication that can, uh, can that can relieve the symptom. So we do symptomatic treatment, and um, that can go along with the uh, therapies or the systemic chemotherapy the patient is receiving. Now. There, is, there has to be a conscientious decision by the patient um, n- knowing that if we're going to initiate therapy or the treatment, these, med- these drugs can cause 
uh, also adverse effects. And many of the therapies we do, to re we we recommend to relieve, or they're f they're uh, they're known to be effective uh, f for, for example, relieving pain, neuropathic pain, are agents that can cause. Uh, for example, cloudiness, or they can patients can get a little bit uh, confused or drowsy initially. Some of them uh, get used to the treatment and they can tolerate it. Others don't. So this is something that we need to discuss with patients, and um, I'm sure that Karen does it to, with with her patients because it's a, it's a major concern for them. And is is because uh, neuropathy can tend to be it can either be temporary or permanent is that correct yes um, so you know we give the general figure that um, about a third of patients will have complete resolution of their peripheral neuropathy symptoms um, if it's due to the uh, chemotherapy once they've completed treatment um, usually within a few months they'll resolve about a third of patients have some residual symptoms that have improved from, um, from the worst point. Uh, and then about a third are left with residual symptoms that are pretty similar to um, when they first developed the symptoms. Um, but, you know, for the most part, most patients do get better. And how do you manage patient expectations? Because I'm sure there's some patients like, I already got cancer and I got tingly feet too. I mean, how do you, how do you handle that? Yes, well, it's important to keep perspective. Um, you know, the, the focus of the primary oncologist is to kill the cancer, you know, get rid of it. And, um, and so some side effects are acceptable when, you know, the goal is to eradicate cancer. Um, you know, I think that um, we try to maximize quality of life. So, you know, treating, focusing the treatment on pain on disability so that patients can walk better, you know, have good balance, they can function in their daily lives at work, at home, um, should be the goal. And if they have a little bit of numbness that's residual, a little bit of tingling but not quite pain, you know, that's acceptable for most patients, but everybody's different. And you said there were different, of course, neuropathy is the most common because we do see it in the general population, but you say there are other uh, pathies or neurological disorders yes. that might be uh, arise from cancer or its treatment. Yes, and that's where the fun of neurology um, resides because, you know, we as neurologists, we love to localize, meaning that um, knowing the anatomy of the nervous system, um, we, you know, we, we do a, a neurological exam to try to pinpoint exactly where the, the problem or the lesion is. It's sort of like, you know, in Houston when you uh, when you you say you, you zone in on a particular neighborhood, like the Galleria or the Museum District, and you know what to find in that individual neighborhood. So, as a neurologist, if you um, if you localize to the peripheral uh, neurologic system, you have the individual nerves. They're connected to muscles, um, and then the nerves um, then run together into nerve plexuses. A plexus means web. So nerve plexus is a tangle of nerve, um, uh, a web, tangled web of nerves. And then that runs into individual nerve roots, um, which then uh, feed into the spinal cord and then the brain. And so problems can exist at any of those levels. And knowing where the problem is helps you narrow down on the list of possibilities. And it's, you know, so we go through a process um, there are more rare uh, forms of peripheral neuropathy. Um, so as you asked, there are plexopathies. There are um, uh, disorders of neuromuscular junction. So the communication between the nerve and muscle is impaired. So that uh, a characteristic um, condition is myasthenia. So patients come in with motor weakness due to not a muscle problem or nerve problem, but in the communication between the two. And Dr. Tremont, how do you work with Dr. Woodman to, to deal with these issues? It, it must be some sort of like team approach, or how do you handle both the cancer and the morbidities? Yeah, it is definitely a team approach. Um, I am 
um, in the capacity of uh, evaluate a patient initially and have a either confirm the diagnosis or have a clue of what is where the lesion is. Uh, but we definitely need um, care and skills to uh, to confirm it. Is uh, uh, she has she has a uh, great uh, knowledge in the area, and uh, I would I would go to her for you know to keep, to present a challenging situation. Um, what she thinks about that, how we better should treat that, and ultimately to run the uh, neurophysiology test that we do for patients in this, with these conditions, and that is the EMG, we call it EMG nerve conduction study. So, which is a study that uh, I will I will leave it up to Karen to explain what the, what that is. Yeah, and EMG stands for electromyopathy. Uh, electromyography. Okay. Um, and uh, it includes it's a two part test. It includes the EMG um, portion, which is done with a needle electrode inserted into the muscle, so that we can record and analyze the electrical activity from the muscle. Um, and then the other part is the nerve conduction study, um, which is uh, a stimulation of different nerves on the surface of the skin with, with a probe and recording the responses from those nerves. Um, so the whole, the entire test is called EMG for short. And uh, so typically patients are referred to you with complaints. It's not like a preemptive thing where you're just doing it, you know what I mean? Typically not. Okay. So patients are usually referred to me for neurologic consultation first um, for, you know, rule out peripheral neuropathy or seems to be like peripheral neuropathy, but maybe, you know, a mimic um, uh, and uh, we'll do a neurologic exam first um, in the clinic and then decide whether or not we need to go one step further and do an EMG test. And there are common probably known to the general public drugs that are used for neuropathy treatment? Yes, yeah, so they're all, as uh, Dr. Tremont mentioned, they're all symptomatic, meaning that we, um, we try to take care of the neuropathic pain um, with these drugs. And, you know, they're reasonably effective, but um, many patients are left with residual symptoms that are acceptable, um, you know, with a little bit of numbness or tingling uh, left over. And some patients need multiple um, combinations of, of medications as well. So, uh, Dr. Tremont, are there any, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of, you know, targeted therapies, drugs that are less toxic. Are there any drugs on the horizon that are trying to minimize, you know, neuropathic issues? Do you know what I mean? Do, ones that kind of target the receptors on the cancer cells and leave everything else alone? Yeah, I think uh, Karen would, can, could probably back me up about that, but there has been no, uh, there is some research on the uh, nerve growth factors that if they're used um, on the, in the appropriate setting for patients uh, with uh, a, with a neuropathy, a chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, it can affect the course of the disease, and that by that I mean it can they can they can be helpful, they can be effective. But this is only the beginnings. I mean, this uh, peripheral neuropathies are we 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 probably do a very good job at localizing, making a localization diagnosis, but it is going to be tough to find the right treatment for them because we don't have anything specific against uh, the neuropathy. It's something specific for the symptom, but not for the underlying process. And in closing, Dr. Woodman, what would you tell patients that are suffering through this? Words of encouragement or advice, what would you say? Well, I'd say that um, always seek help when, you know, at the first sign of symptoms. If you're worried about a symptom, come on in and have it assessed. Try not to minimize your symptoms um, and, you know, and tough it out. Um, we have treatments for, for pain, for discomfort, just to make life better. And in the process, we can then try to look at the underlying cause. Neuropathy can be a cause um, at, or can be caused by not just the chemotherapy, but by you know, underlying conditions that are as yet not diagnosed. Patients may have early diabetes that they don't know about. They may have vitamin B12 mm -hmm. deficiency mm -hmm. or other nutritional deficiencies um, that can cause neuropathy. 
Um, you know, I had a patient with a copper deficiency from, uh, from, from a uh, GI cancer, uh, causing her to not be able to walk. She was constantly falling. And so, you know, that diagnosis was made because she came in um, and, and, you know, kept um, uh, being patient with us um, uh, and, and allowed us to uh, get her repleted with copper. Because it seems like a lot of patients will say, well, you know, I've, my doctor's doing so much, I don't want to bother him about this little bitty thing. That's right. And, and you know, my, uh, I really encourage patients to, you know, use all the resources available and come on in. If it's nothing to worry about, that's something that we can decide after, you know, after we, we hear about the symptoms and, and um, take a look at, at everything. Good advice. Dr. Woodman, thank you very much. Dr. Tremont, thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. If you have questions about anything you've heard today on Cancer Newsline, contact Ask MD Anderson at 1-877-MDA-6789 or online at mdanderson.org slash ask. Thank you for listening to this episode of Cancer Newsline. Tune in for the next podcast in our series.